Welcome to NAFA's Advisor Today podcast series, where we focus on how financial advisors work, live, and give to their local communities and our greater financial services industry. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, Nafa Nation. I'm your co-host, Chris Gandy. I'm here with our, our other co-host, Suzanne Carawan. Hi, Suzanne. Hey, Chris. How you doing? Thank you for tuning in to Advisor Today's podcast. But before we get to our wonderful guest today, Suzanne, can you share with us our sponsor for our wonderful podcast today? Yeah, as we uh, as we wrap up February, we're wrapping up Ensure Your Love Month. So this month's uh, or this episode's sponsor is Life Happens. So again, we're happy that Life Happens is now part of the NAFA expanded family. And if you're a NAFA member, just remember you get special assets from Life Happens. If you're not a NAFA member, well, you really should think about joining. You can go to belong.nafa.org forward slash join. I'm sure we're going to hear from our guests today about some of the benefits of belonging, but we um, are very happy to partner and be part of the Life Happens family. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and those who don't know don't know that NAFA has a, a family of, of relationships and Life Happens is one that that is intertwined and and is is mission set similar to the ones which we have which is helping the world be a better place for all all people and providing security and services for those uh, those families out there in America and Main Street specifically. So with that being said, Suzanne, can you introduce our wonderful uh guest for today? I look forward to having a a conversation with him. Yeah, today's guest is Demetrius Bryant. I have been fortunate now to know Demetrius for a couple of years. We've known each other, right? And right. Uh, we were I was blessed enough to be able to see, sit at his table during our National Leadership Conference two years ago, I believe, when he got sworn in to being president of his state. And it was, uh, it was really a momentous occasion for me. I was there with his wife, and she was holding his hand, and she... Uh, leaned over to him and she said, I am so, I'm going to teary eyed telling you this. She said, I am so proud of you. Right. And this is one of those things that only can happen, I think, at NAFA and understanding uh, Demetrius. We're going to hear all about his servant leadership heart today. So, Demetrius, we're so happy to have you on the podcast. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I was, uh, I'm honored to be, you know, just on the podcast. I mean, this is where the heavy hitters come. I'm just, uh, Small the playmakers. <laughs> you know, Demetrius, we, we've been talking a lot. Is this is where the champions? This is a champions league, right? So, so we're going to go from 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 the amateur level, right, and we're going to where where the champions go and uh, where they win and they win consistently. So, with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about your journey. Um, people may have seen you, but they may not know who you are. The goal of this podcast is for people to kind of get to know you. So. Can you share a little bit about how did you get into the industry and 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 what attracted you to join an association like NAFA? Okay, um, good question. Uh, well, let's start with how, how did I get into the industry? Um, I spent uh, 15 years in the automobile industry, which was a sales-oriented industry, and um, I kind of reached a pinnacle in that industry and wanted to make a career change or needed to make a career change uh, and there were two other industries that i was interested in which was insurance and real estate and i felt that i could help my community more uh, being in insurance than i could in real estate because obviously i would only be able to maybe sell them one house per you know per family Whereas uh, in the insurance industry, I'd be able to do multiple facets and also teach them uh, about the importance of insurance. So uh, that that was my decision for insurance. And um, NAFA became, uh, I was invited to a NAFA luncheon uh, when I was uh, actually writing business for Mutual of Omaha. And uh, their office was... Uh, uh, members of NAFA and they invited me out and I walked into this room that was filled with people and I said well this has got to be something to this because people just not coming for the lunch it's just a buffet so it, you know, it was okay but it's just a buffet I uh, got a chance to sit in and listen to some speakers and 
just talk to a few of the people there and and, and how long they had been a part of NAFA and kind of got the impression that people don't stay attached to an organization if it's not helping them in their career or help them make more money. So I, I understood that this was something that I wanted to be committed to, and that's where I started. So can you tell us a little bit about how long have you have you been in the business? And um, we know you, sir, well, I'll talk about leadership here in a minute, but can you share with us a little bit about how long you've been in the business and then what is your primary practice? Is it money management? Is it multi-line? Is it, is right. it, just, tell us a little bit about your practice and where you practice at, because I know most people don't know where you don't practice, know. but it's an important part of who you are and where you come from. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, my practice is in Byron, Mississippi, which is um, just on the southern edge of the Jackson, uh, Mississippi. Uh, it's in central Mississippi. Um, but I, I, I'm a multi-line uh, insurance agency. I'm an independent, of course. Um, and I've started this in 2011, Brian Agency. And uh, it, it's been an incredible journey to be here um, going on 13 years later. Uh, I've had the opportunity to pick up three books of business uh, over those uh, 13 years, and it has helped me grow. I have uh, three full-time employees here. Uh, so, you, you know, it, it's the insurance industry in itself is, is, is a great industry, but to be able to employ people and teach people uh, and, and, and how it can help them in their personal journey as well as their community and they can, how they can change lives and things like that. It, it's just, that's more money than I could ever accept myself. I get the privilege out of helping people more than I do the money that comes with it. Awesome. So, so, so that feeling of, 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 of being the catalyst for change in their lives. Right. Is important. So, so tell me a little bit about. I mean, you're in the South, right? So you're in Miss. Are right. you from Mississippi? Where are you originally from? I am. This okay. is it. Born and raised. Okay. So, so tell us how different. I mean, I think some people sometimes don't understand the differences of of business. Um, as a producer myself, I understand that there's certain places in the country where business is a little different, right? It's 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 different. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, if you're an outsider, it's, you know, like, no, like Chicago is one of those. I got a guy. Right. And so if you're not from Chicago, can you do business in Chicago? Yeah. But it's a lot easier to do business if you're from Chicago and you're in Chicago. Um, right. Share with us a little bit about kind of the business acumen. If I was going to move down to your area, um, what are some of the the unique traits of doing business in the uh, the southern the southern district or, or the Mississippi area? Well. I mean, we are friendly. We are the hospitality state. Some people may not agree with that, but we are actually very friendly. Um, I think one of the important aspects of doing business here in the South is just being able to look at people, speak to people face to face, and they want to know who they're dealing with. They want to feel that you've been here all your life and that you're concerned about something that if they pass along to their children and their children's children, they got someone that they can deal with and not have to be, oh, well, it used to be this company, it used to be this company. I don't know who my agent is now. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a real friendly environment. Once you can come in and sit down in front of a family and you can explain to them the benefits of what you're doing for them, I think it's a lifelong commitment then. No one's leaving you after that. And if you were moving here, I would suggest that you get out, get in with someone that's from here, that's deep rooted in the community in this area, and let them walk you into some houses and speak to some of the people and get to know some of the people. And from that, I think you can grow to be uh, just as successful. You mentioned the fact that you are... Um... You're an independent, um, multi-line, and you've been able to employ uh, some people. Can you share with us a little bit about your, your your vision for your practice and where you're trying to go with it and, and why that's meaningful to you? 
Yes, um, of course, uh, being a Lilly grad, um, and one of the things we, we had to do in, in the course was talk about, you know, your plans. What 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 was the ultimate goal of the Bryant Agency and where did you want this to go? And of course, you know, early on when I started, I always thought about I wanted to scale the business to be able to be a Southeast um, United States, you know, think big. And uh, as I got into the industry and started to understand that that personal touch, I mean, it, I can, just for Mississippi, if just, just doing business here in Mississippi has shown me that I don't necessarily have to be the biggest and the, and, and the brightest in this particular industry, but I can be the best here in Mississippi that they have an offer and I could be so satisfied with that. So I, I'm, I've, I've dialed back the thought process of scaling um, huh. to be this, you know, enormous uh, Southeast company, Southeast United States company, but I want to just really be a fingerprint in every household in this area. And I want to, and in that, being that, there are so many of us that don't really understand what insurance is, what it does, and the legacy that it can leave for generations to come. And I just tell you, if, if I can just reproduce myself through my employees and they can do that and explain that to their clients and, and, and get that, man, this place would be so much better. And I'll be okay with it being better. So how how do you that's interesting because how do you explain that that generational wealth piece of it and then are your do your clients get it I guess is I I'd love to know how you're actually explaining that because it is really exciting and it, it's it's amazing that more people I feel like don't don't get excited by that and say I can make a difference in this long term piece of it but how do you how do you explain that how do you how do you connect with them to t explain that piece well, the biggest, the, the, the generation, uh, I should say, after me, my children, they, they get it because they understand that they don't want to work for anybody. They want to work for themselves. They want to be self-sufficient and things like that. So they get that point. But it's my generation and the generation before, like my parents, they, they were... Unfortunately, they weren't taught everything there was to know about insurance and generational wealth. It was get a job, you know, uh, I'm sorry, go to school, get out of school, get a job, get a good job, stay at your job, get married, buy your house. Ta-da, you're going to be successful. Well, they didn't know. So it was up to us, which I think we're the first generation really to have as much uh, middle middle income wealth as you want to call it that we have uh, that we've amassed in, in, in education so in building that education now i have to go back and try to fill that gap because rural mississippi still are living off of burial policies the terminology burial policy i got a burial there's a debit person that comes by every week or, or or once a month and collect, you know, twenty thirty dollars for a five thousand six thousand dollar burial policy because that was what their parents told them and that's that's what they still remember. So you have to explain to them that it, the burial policy is really it's life insurance. It's just a small amount. And if you say, well, Mister or Miss Customer. I know you have $5,000 of life insurance that will, you know, obviously take care of some of your final expenses. But what about your children? Have you ever thought about if you could write a check to one of your children today and say, take this check and go and live life, accomplish what you need to accomplish, wouldn't you do that? Well, sure, I would. But I don't have that kind of money. I said, and this is why life insurance would be that avenue for you to leave your children that legacy. And because children 
their children may be older now. I need them in the room to explain to them, your parents would love to leave you a legacy. However, at this point in their life, they can't, but they are willing to allow you to write a policy on them that will allow them to leave that for you. So oh. now I got the children saying, oh, okay. So let me write a policy because uh, as a parent, I'm, I, my children can write as much as they can afford because it's not a matter. It's not a matter of if I'm going to die. It's not a matter of when I'm going to die. But if you can afford to write $10 million on me, you, I'm an insurable interest. I'm saying go for it because that's going to change your life, your children's life, and your children's children's life because you're going to do what you're supposed to do with that and invest it in the right way. So if I can get more people to understand that their parents need insuring and to take to write policies on their parents outside of just the basic aerial policy, it can help change their lives. I mean, it's other people do it. Other people do. It. That's just what other people do. You know, we have a, 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 a half a million dollar term policy that's coming up to um, expire. And when we get 70 years old, it's like, well, we don't need that anymore. I, I really can't afford it. I don't need it. The kids are good. Why not convert that policy and give your children equal you can let each one of them equally own that policy and let them continue to 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 keep this policy out here instead of spending 30 years of paying for it now that you didn't need it and you just want to let it go convert it to whole life and allow your children to take that money as a legacy when you leave here i mean we just got to educate we got to continue to educate because unfortunately the majority of our community don't know that. When you when you yeah. said hey, our community, can you mm -hmm. share with us a little bit about? Give us some some point some point of reference. When you say our community, what do you mean by our community? And then what are you doing in the community to continue to further those missions? Are are there any initiatives that you're doing? Are there any unique? Um, sales things that you're doing? Is there any um, to help create those generational wealth conversations? Well, of course, when I say our community, I, I'm, I'm speaking about the Black community, the Hispanic community, um, the Asian community. I'm thinking about every other community that has never taken on this role and, and been aware of what insurance can do for them and their family as a legacy. So I, that's that's what I'm talking about because other uh, other races have been able to, they, they got this. They're the ones who started this. They're the ones who mastered how insurance would be paid. They, they, they're the gatekeeper. Okay, so I, I want to talk to everyone who never knew they could do this, never knew these opportunities were here in our community. And I want them to know know this. And I want them to at least, even if they don't do it, I want them to at least be able to, to uh, teach their children that this is an opportunity if they start soon enough that will change their lives forever. And you you say, what do what what am I doing? What do we do? Um, we are always at, you know, at our church events. When they church have um, educational fairs where they may have people in the banking industry, people in the auto industry, people in the insurance industry, and, you know, they talk about people with uh, credit in, in the credit industry or whatever, and they have all of us in, a, in, a, in an environment on a Saturday or whatever, and they have all the members and, and guests come in to sit down with small in small groups and just kind of come around to each session and, and learn a little bit about their credit, learn a little bit about what insurance does for them, learn a little bit about um, financing with, with automobiles, with automobiles and houses, things like that. Those kind of things that we do and that we continue to do 
to one, be a viable name in the community so that people, when people think about insurance and stuff, you know, other than seeing me on a shopping cart, <laughs> they 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 understand that, oh, I remember we went to the thing at the church and he talked about and things like that. Those are those are things in the community that we try to do uh, at every opportunity to, so that people get a chance to hear about insurance and what it can do for them. Um, just one one small thing, we, we're talking more about life insurance, but the, the small point about property and casualty and auto insurance, one of the things that really drove me into this industry was the fact that people think uh, about auto insurance is, this is what they know. I want full coverage insurance and how much it is. And does this cover a rental car? That's it. Our community. Our community. We don't, we're not, we don't, nobody's talking about what uninsured, underinsured motorist does for your policy. And if you have more than one vehicle, how that can stack, how that money stack, it can help cover uh, a loss in the event it was something, whether you did it or something you did do. People don't understand that here, 50% of the people out here driving don't have auto insurance. So if I just got liability, whoa, I need some <laughs> uninsured motors because I need because the guy that's next to me or the lady that's next to me probably don't have insurance. And if they hit me and I got a car that's paid for and it's just liability and they don't have any insurance, I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. Uninsured, underinsured motorist takes care of that. So now if they hit you and they don't have insurance and you have that on your policy, guess what? Now you can get some value for your vehicle. And when you explain that to them, it's like, oh, they never told me that. Oh, they never ever told me that. I just, I just wanted insurance. Nobody explained it to me. So that's something, that's a lost piece of the insurance industry. I think, I think people are so busy trying to sell that they're, that they forget to inform because I'm, I'm an advisor. I'm, I read contracts. That's, well, that's what I do as an insurance. I do. I explain contracts. This is a contract with the insurance company, and this is what it's saying. And these are the coverages you have. And this, and if this happens, call me. Call the office first. Don't call the eight hundred number. We don't right. know if this claim is really going to be worth filing because we don't know how much damage has been done. So what about the um, rock picks? And I go get my oil chain and say, oh, we can buy this on your insurance. And I got this car and my wife drives this car and we can fix this on your insurance. And then when you come up for renewal, the insurance company says, well, we're either going to increase your premium or we're not going to rewrite you at all because you got a lot of claim activity. And you, I hadn't filed any claim. Every time you file, Every time there's a towing, roadside assistance, uh, comp claim for windshields, those are claims, but we don't recognize those as actual claims. So again, education for our community is so important and key, keeping them educated and keeping them on our books, at least for me. What I, what I think is important there, though you said, Demetrius, which you didn't say it, but I'm, I'm going to articulate it, is that. I don't think those contracts and all the things that are in all these pieces, most people don't understand what's in those insurance policies. It's right. Pages after pages, like, yeah, okay, whatever. What's the, you know, how much is per month? But what you're doing is you're giving them use cases, right? You're saying, if this happens, you do this. And the big piece there is just like, no matter what, call me, <laughs> just right. call right. me. I'll be right. that interpreter because I, I, you know, don't feel stupid that you don't understand this contract stuff. Like this is your license to do that, but go ahead and just rely on me when, when those situations arise. And the, of course that you being able to translate that, of course, that does increase your, the trust factor opens the door to more conversations. But I think that's, that's a nice, um, that's a nice piece of mind. That's a nice way to explain it. 
right? And to tell right. the person, hey, listen, nobody understands what this is saying. Like I had to study for it and get licensed for it, but you call me and we'll we'll take care of it. Exactly. Exactly. You know, Demetrius, kudos to you because um, you know, I, I think a lot of people on the sales side, they're looking for again the next sale. Like, hey, I gotta get to the next sale, I'll get to the next sale. You taking the time to first educate, you know, two types of people in this world. There's the informed and the uninformed. And many times we ask people to make informed decisions on information they don't have. Mm -hmm. So taking the time to educate people so you can empower them to make educated decisions is super important. Um, and kudos to you for, for, for doing that. But let's talk about leadership, servant leadership for a moment. Let's shift gears. So we've talked about the industry a little bit. Um, you went to a meeting, but all of a sudden now you're leading a state. I mean, that's a big gap. That's a jump. Like, so, so how do you go from going to a meeting, a luncheon, which, uh, you know, Suzanne, we got to bring those back. You know, I remember when I first started, we'd go to lunch and it was sold out. It was like, this is where, this is, the, this is where all the champions, this is where all the players go. And we were able to put down our, our corporate affiliations and go to, go to these lunches and, and learn and respect each other um, and do business amongst each other. So we need to get back to that. Um, uh, I think COVID did not help, but we digress. But let me get back to how did you get from point A to saying, hey, I, uh, yeah, you know, I, I might, I think I have what it takes to lead and then jumping into the role of leadership. Share with us kind of your journey and, and, and what were the key things that you looked at that made it pretty obvious for you that this was your path? <laughs> well, you know, honestly, uh, I've, I've, I've basically excelled to a leader's role in everything that I've done. And, uh, you know, honestly, going to meetings and, and sitting in and listening and having questions and asking questions and not really always getting answers. Um, you know, I started to think about, uh, you know, they talking about this board and getting on the board. And I said, I have a lot of questions. And, you know, a lot of times I'm not getting an answer or getting the answer that I think is, you know, really uh, to the heart of what I'm speaking on. Um, so maybe I'll try this board thing here and just see how this goes because I want to, because if I'm asking questions, then there are other people that have questions and they're going to want answers too. So uh, during this journey, uh, after a couple of years, I just decided to uh, volunteer to be on the board. And the first year, I think I kind of just sat back and listened and learned. Uh, and after that, I was like, well, no, we're not doing that anymore. I'm not going for that. I'm not. Nope. Nope. This does not benefit the people. Nope. 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 So I kind of became a kind of outspoken person. <laughs> and they was like, hey, you know, maybe you ever think about going through the chair? I was like, what's the chair? <laughs> so um, we kind of got into the chair thing. And, and, and it's all because I want people who don't know to know. I want people who are, as you said, uninformed to be informed. Uh, about what this organization does uh, for the industry as a whole, as a whole, and and why we can't get more people to uh, become attached what this organization does. And um, I I think we had some again we had some energy, we had COVID, and then we just kind of was was at a standstill. And the whole idea for me has been to just trying to get the train moving again. Mm -hmm. So if we can get the train moving, the next person can jump on and we got momentum and uh, we can keep moving. Uh, so um, again, I, I, I'm just not a status quo kind of guy. I mean, if it, if it don't fit, I'm not gonna force it, but I'm gonna ask a question about it for sure. So we know that uh, membership, I was just so ring true to Suzanne's ears, 
we know membership, membership, membership is is such a vital role to a a a, a non for profit. You know, we are volunteers, right? And we have right. jobs, and you know, we choose to do this job. Um, we're paid in other ways other than monetarily, but so 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 membership. What are what unique things is Mississippi doing? Because we don't get a chance to talk to you. I mean, you're in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I, mean, you know, I play sports, and so so at the end of the day, you guys may not be on ABC or ESPN. You guys may right. be on ESPN two, or you may be on you know, Fox Prime or something. But you know, mm -hmm. syndic syndicated TV. But you know, my question is, what are you guys doing that's unique? To bring value and to increase the membership in Mississippi, perhaps you could share some of those some of those gems, some of those secrets that you guys are utilizing and doing. Well, I, I don't know if they're really considered secrets, but um, basically, what we we've tried to do is one take advantage of our associates in the states that, and you know, we have um, associates in. You know, Northeast Mississippi, you know, of course, Jackson is, is central. We have South, Southeast and Southwest Mississippi. And we've just tried to take advantage of of the the people that we have in place up there to have to try to have more um, lunches. We try to bring speakers in to get them together to come in and say, oh, hmm, this is interesting. And I we, we did some different things. We've done some different things. Because the lunches were the things that we've always done. We started doing some things after work. Uh, we started from five to seven, something. We have some little light snacks and things like that. And have people come in. We have our nature gear out and stuff and have, you know, trying to um, get new people to come in. And it may be interested in this that didn't know about this. But the lunches and things that are going on is not something that, if you're not a member of NAFE, a lot of times you don't really have that opportunity to to hear about them or come go to those events, but you would be more willing in an afternoon after work setting where it's a little mm -hmm. bit more laid back, a little bit more relaxed. And, you know, you just, as I say, you just slide in and just kind of see what's going on. And, you know, you, you know we're going to welcome you in there and, and just you know, ask a little information about you're not going to put any pressure on you at the, this time, you know, but just give you some information to learn about what NAFA does and how this can can help your uh, practice. And those things have helped. We get we, we do have some traction. It's not enough, um, but we do have some traction. Um, I don't know, you know, you know, with everything being um like Zoom, everybody's doing, you know, you know, sometimes that makes a generation really, really lazy. Hmm. And they're like, yeah, you know, I y'all can't do a Zoom meeting and so I can see what it's like selling a car. Years ago, somebody's just on the phone on the couch saying, Yeah, what kind of I saw you got this kind of car. What kind of price can you get for me? Well, I don't know. When you gonna come look at it? Well, I don't know. If you get just tell me what kind of price you can I can't sell you a car sitting on the couch because all you're going to do is hang up from me and call somebody else and tell them the same thing. I need you to come look at my car and why my car is different. Come look at NAFA and let's see why NAFA is different. Come into the building. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about what you know about NAFA. Most people don't know anything about NAFA. I, I promise you. Say, Have you ever heard of NAFA? What's that? Is You said NRA? <laughs> no, NAFA. NAFA. No. Um, and that's always a starting point. NAFA. What is NAFA? And then I explain to them what NAFA is and a lot of things that it has done to help their industry and uh what it would take, you know, why don't you come to a meeting or whatever? And people are just uh sometimes slow to want to come in, especially if they've been in the industry for a while. Because they feel like they got it figured out. I already got I got this figured out. I don't need this this whatever this nature thing is. I don't really need it. I'm good. Whatever they've been doing, I appreciate it because I'm still here. I still got my business. So I don't see a need or a value in me having to spend, you know, eight hundred bucks a year to do this. 
And uh and 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 honestly, the seasoned uh agents that I have spoken with, that's literally what they're saying. Hey, I've been around for 15, 20 years and I'm doing fine. I ain't never been a member of NAFA and you know, why I why well, I want to pay you eight hundred dollars a year to do something. I've been here this long, I, you know, I'm gonna be here. So, you oh. know. All good and good. The DOL shows up. Yeah, exactly. So, how how did you get involved in the advocacy part, Demetrius? Uh, that, that you know, here we go again. They were talking about advocacy and you know what advocacy does for the organization. You need people on the front line. You need people out. You know, support. You know, like well, you what you mean? Tell me, we got people that are working behind the scenes for our organization, and how is that? You know, how are they getting paid? How how does all of this work? Well, you know, we have a pack, so we have to pay on the pack, and these are the things we have to do, and this helps them do that. Okay, well, let me, I need to contribute with the pack and things like that. That's important. And then I got a chance to meet our lobbyist here. And, um, you know, I kind of watched him um uh, one uh, day at the Capitol, you know, kind of walking around hobnobbing, as I would call it, talking to all the different people. I was like, man, this guy's pretty influential. If 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 he's, you know, if all these people, senators and representatives know him and, and things like that, and they all saying the same thing, it seems like we really need to be more connected. And so I decided to uh, up my game because I was really uh, underperforming in that in that area, um, and it's it's something that's important to the industry. It's, it's important to what I do, and I'm just one of those dudes that I'm either all in or I'm gonna be all out. So if as long as I'm all in, we all good. But if if, if I ever get on the all out side, you, you, you know, you better, you better watch come out. grab me. You better <laughs> come grab me quick. <laughs> so ha- has it has it actually? Have you seen a benefit to your business from making all these connections and being, have you yourself become more influential? You know, I know you're humble. Maybe I am, <laughs> ma- ma- you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I am. I don't know. I, but I'm, a lot of people obviously recognize me when I'm in different um, mm-hmm. venues and uh, whether that's church, whether that's NAFA, whether that's, you know, because I've uh, been hanging out with my lobbyists, I don't know. Maybe it's my shopping cart ads. I don't know, but um, I, I, I'm definitely, I, I, I'm definitely recognized. Um, I don't know if I want to say I'm a big deal or whatever stuff. I just want to help people. I just, man, I just want to educate Thanks, yeah. people, man. That's it. Now, now, Chris, one thing Demetrius didn't mention is that he is tall. He's tall. And so we got to talking and I knew there's just the way he carries himself. And like, you know, were you an athlete? Did you play ball? Because I'm thinking he played basketball, right? Because he's tall. And uh, he said, no, I played tennis. And I went, what? <laughs> because that <laughs> his rotation has got to be him with a tennis racket in his hand. Yeah. I had the wingspan. So I was like, how fast could you possibly right serve that ball? Because <laughs> so he's got that mindset. He came into this yeah. business. As an athlete, yeah. always that constant improvement, always be improving mindset. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the that was funny actually. Um, uh, I got cut in middle school my the my seventh grade year, um, the last round of cuts, and I was like, man, I was so heartbroken. I was like, this man, I was better than that, <sighs> and I found. Um, at the park, I found a ping pong table. I left a ping pong table, a, a paddle out at the park. And I'm messing around, and people were on the tennis court. And I said, well, I, let me just see if I can hit a ball with this ping pong paddle back on the tennis court. Of course, I couldn't. But I was pretty decent without ever really playing ping pong. And I said, well. So I might be able to go out for um, tennis. So they have tennis tryouts, which was after basketball. 
went out, didn't even have a racket or anything, of course. You know, uh, barred the coach racket. I'm left-handed. Uh, I do a lot of things okay. right-handed, but I'm left-handed. And served the ball. It went in, and that was it. The rest was history. It was tennis, 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 tennis. And I, from middle school, high school, college, um, you know, I played up until um, I played two years after college competitively because I traveled and played around stuff. And, and after that, um, I gave it up. But I was decent. Um, I was I was fairly decent in, in tennis. Stuff. Uh, yeah. That's a great story. <laughs> you know that's that's an that's, it's interesting you know what you know kind of how you got here kind of that journey um if we looked at uh your you mentioned the fact that you you've never been one to kind of you know let's say you've you've challenged the status quo right mm -hmm. of what you see and and what you would like to see in the world and so what do you see some of the challenges ahead that face us now as the industry is ever evolving we've got ai being introduced into the industry right we've got industry we've got organizations companies banks now saying we'll mm -hmm. dabble financial services come in you know you can, you can go to the private room eat the nice cookies and we'll, you know, <laughs> we'll help you, you, know. And, you know you got a lot of people now and now you have the direct to consumer programs where mm -hmm. there is no advisor so what do you see some of the challenges that are out there for for advisors um, since this is advisor days? What do you see some of the challenges and what are you doing to be ahead of those, be proactive on overcoming some of them? Well, the, um, I think the biggest thing is know your clients, be uh, a considered a family member to your clients. I said, because no matter what comes out if you have that relationship with your clients ai is not going to take your clients what will take your clients is you taking your clients for granted uh, i think it's never been more important for us to have those personal relationships with those clients like never before to a lot so that they understand that you still have their best interest at heart on every aspect of their life, whatever you're managing for them, whatever, even if it's just, again, just call me first. You know, something as simple as call me first will allow you one extra phone call that you may not get otherwise. That could be the difference of someone deciding to stay with you or doing this online without an advisor, because I think it might be a little cheaper. You know, you can't beat cheap, but cheap does not always be in your best interest. So, I, I, you know, if you're interested in cheap, that's not, I'm not the right fit for you. But if you're interested in someone that's going to walk with you and be with you through every step of this journey from now till we leave here, that's who you that's who you need and that's who you got with me and that's what i sell i sell me and me being the person that's going to be able to take the time to walk through every process of every policy that we do with you and how this is an advantage to you and if you believe in your advisor and you believe that that person is part of your family and has done nothing but try to do what's in your best interest you know, AI won't be it. Neither will uh, doing it online because Geico, uh, Geico can't, can't cannot keep a customer when they're unhappy. Especially when when I get through talking to them, I'll get a Geico customer every time because they can't even tell me who their agent is. Who's your agent? If you was in the grocery store, who's your agent? Did you point your your agent out? You mean tell me you paying people and you don't even know where your money going to? Why would you do that? Hmm. Oh, okay. Well, what you mean? You're paying someone to do a job that you don't even know who they are. You don't have a relationship with them. Why would you do that? 
Hmm. Okay. You'd be surprised that when people start, you can see the little hamster in yep. the wheel turning. Like, Sounds crazy, right? You're like, yeah, why, why am I paying somebody? I don't even know who they are. What they do? Yeah, you. And if I do the same thing, you know me. You see me. I'm everywhere. I'm on the shopping cart. We got to get a picture of the shopping cart. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, those are the things that I think that 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 will keep us relevant going into this next phase uh, of the industry. And I think it's, it's so very important that we do that, that we continue to do that. And, you know, I know a lot of our younger agents like to do a lot of stuff mobile. Uh, they like to do a lot of texting and a lot of, and, and if that's the group that they're doing it, that's not a personal relationship. Mm-hmm. The same way they can text someone, so can someone else text them too. And you could lose client in the midst of texting them because of how they're feeling that day when you're texting them, because that's how they're going to interpret your text message based on how they're feeling at the time they get that text message. Right. Don't do it. Don't do it. You know, Demetrius, uh, a couple of things that I'll just comment. Um, I'll just say on, on, um, on price, you know, I've heard a couple of things. Price is only an issue in the absence of value, right? And and then so, you know, when people start shopping, they, they instantly don't see the value in you being their person. I mean, it is what right. it is. Um, or like my father once said, everything that looks good to you don't mean it's good for you. <laughs> or <laughs> sure. it's cheap doesn't mean it's the best thing for you, right? You know, yeah. or you know, he 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 you know, he's from the South, so he says everything. Mm-hmm good to you don't mean it's good for you that's what he's that's how he said <laughs> I, I formalized it so we could bring it to the north but you know yeah um, i think the solution you know demetrius if we, if we go back to as leaders of people and movers of hearts i mean at the end of the day that's what we do when we when we inspire people to be part of the nafa family you know the simplest thing is share this with someone else. You know, if we asked our, you know, when I, I was in Chicago and I, I led our board, I asked them one thing. I said, listen, I need for you to, to recruit, you have to recruit this many people. But if we asked if to come to an event, you have to bring someone. What we would find out is there's, and you have to bring someone who's not a member, you know, because we have a tendency to the member, hey, listen, you want to go? Yeah, we're already members. Okay, got it. Right? They've heard the story. But now if we have to prospect with someone, it's just prospecting, right? We have to look for someone who we have not invited. And if every event, we had five events a year and we invited someone who was not a member, NAFA would look completely different than it does today. As simplistic as that sounds. Right. That, it is. As simplistic as that sounds. That mm-hmm. changes the environment, it changes the people that hear the message. It changes. And because I was on a call earlier today with our, our exec board and I heard the conversation, uh, I'll give Brock Jolly a, a shout out, right? Brock said that enthusiasm is contagious. And one of the challenges that we all face in our in our dear Nathan Nation is we've got to wake up the enthusiasm. Because mm-hmm. people want to be part of something that people are super excited about. You know, right. Demetrius, you show up and I say, hey, Demetrius, say, good to see you. Hey, man, I can't wait to, man, I can't wait to share. You're like, oh, what are we doing, right? But if I show up, hey, nice to meet you. You know, I'm a NAFA member for 20 years, you know. Great. Now, good luck, kid. Right? I'm not overly excited about being a part of that. And I know right. that you you carry a level of enthusiasm because I've had conversation with you and I've, I've spoken to you, but you carry a level of that enthusiasm. And I think off the challenge ahead of us is we have to wake that enthusiasm. We have to light that fire again right. and yeah. get some young young people in the business. Um, I'll just throw this out to you since I know you're in Mississippi. Um, we've been able to start to successfully build relationships with the or with the universities. Mm-hmm that are now starting to 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 have curriculums around finance and NAFA nation you know we've got our college program i think that'd be a fantastic program 
to now start rolling out in your as a part of your state with schools like my home state town, Mississippi State, Mississippi, <laughs> Mississippi. Um, right. Ole Miss, Ole Miss, some of the some of the, oh, some of the major universities. And again, if you can inspire one person, that's that's significant, that's successful. But if you can inspire a group of people because you've impacted the culture, I think that's just so, so smart. So it's just, just something, just a couple of things that are we've heard that's working. Mm-hmm. We know it's working. And again, that's the younger generation of advisors and who they're going to be in the future. And we can influence them very early on when they're still green peas. That's always a good thing. Right. <laughs> I'm, 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 it's, it's interesting you said that we went to Insurance Day last year, uh, went up to, and it was at Mississippi State. Um, and uh, I actually did get a chance to speak to uh, several uh, juniors that came up and you know, what is, you know, what is Nathan? And then they kind of asked about the insurance industry because I don't know why the insurance industry kind of got the stereotype, kind of like the automobile industry. Like we were just shysters, you know, we're trying to, you know, get your money. And it's not a profitable professional industry. I don't know where it came from, but, you know, after having, conversation with these uh, young men and uh, I, they were like, I, I kind of think I might want to look at doing this. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, uh, I told them we'll be back, you know, this year in April, they have insurance day again, and we'll be back. We'll have a, a table and everything. And hopefully they'll be there and they'll be getting ready to graduate. And they'll be, Hey, remember me? I'm like, do you remember me though? Uh-huh. Because I need you to come in. But yeah. uh, you know that's interesting. I think you're right. We should be more focused in the at, uh, in the colleges and the universities and things like that because this this industry is definitely one that you people take for granted. You know there are a bunch of bunch of money makers in this industry and uh, uh-huh. you know bunch of money. Who better than us? Right? Yeah, better- right. right. That's right. New leaders than us. It should be us. Well, Chris, right. speaking of that, we, we're at our lightning round. We need to lightning. No, the- we, we got to shoot. We got to shoot. We got to shoot. So, so Demetrius, uh, we have a lightning round. This is not the hot seat. This is just an opportunity for us, for people to get to know you personally. Um, and again, you don't really have to think about these answers. These answers are probably going to come to you. And the first answer that comes to you typically is the right answer. Okay. Well, so okay. we'll start with some, some, something easy, right? Um, when yeah. you were growing up, what was your favorite? Cereal. <laughs> my favorite cereal was Frosted Flakes. I never got them. <laughs> but that was my favorite cereal. Never got them. You know, we got corn flakes and you better put some sugar on them. <laughs> All right. See, see that those are those those, those are easy. Um so Demetrius, um your most oh well I'm not gonna ask yeah. this. You're in Mississippi, so I gotta ask Ole Miss or Mississippi State. Well, uh, my daughter went to Ole Miss and ran track, so I was Ole Miss while she was there. Uh, but I always kind of liked Mississippi State. Okay. Um, your your proudest moment in the industry so far? Proudest moment when I bought my third book of business. I think I really felt like we 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 really accomplished some things, and to be able to to do that was uh, pretty, that was pretty satisfying. Mentors, um, who's been your most pivotal or most significant mentor during your, during your career? Uh, I, have, uh, I, have, I have a really uh, good friend that has been an Allstate agent for 35 years. And, um, you know, he has helped walk me through some, some of this journey. Uh, and I take a lot of what he has done and, you know, I take what I can use and I put it into me and how I can make it stand. And, and but I think he has probably been the most influential in this industry for me. It's Black History Month. So let me ask you the question. Um, in a pivotal month like this month, what are some what is a message that that you know, is still resounding that you would say that's significant 
in the way in which we see the world and that's that you would like to share during Black History Month? Um, uh, you know, we, we still have a long way to go. I mean, we, we just do. We just do. Um, we've made a we've made a lot of strides. I mean, I, I, I think about when uh, Howard Ketchens, um, you know, how his story, I had a conversation with him, how his story, how he got to where he was, how he even got into the industry because he was a teacher and uh, how he noticed the janitors and cafeteria workers were not the insurance people that were coming in were not talking to them and the bus drivers. And he found that niche and that got him to where he is and, and, and his determination in this. Uh, he always said that um, money is green. No matter where you get it from, money is green. And he said that was always a focus of his. But I, I think we have to continue to understand that we are still have a long way to go. Uh, we've made some strides, but um, we, we, we got to respect. We got to respect one another. Uh, we just some, sometimes it just feels like there's no respect. And when you can sense it and not even have a conversation with somebody, it, it, it really uh, demoralizes you in this so, uh, respect. We got a long way to go. And let's let's keep talking about it because I don't let it go. I can't let it go. All right. Last thing. Uh, Nathan Nation, to those young advisors out there, someone listening to Demetrius for the first time, mm -hmm. what words of wisdom would you give somebody who's starting in the business today? Uh, words of wisdom would be find you a mentor to walk with you in this journey. It's very important to have someone that has experience that has been through and, and maybe is it still going through some of the issues that you may come up with. Uh, that could be defining moments to what to, that will allow you to stay in the industry or get out of the industry. Find mm -hmm. you a mentor and walk with them through this journey to make your life a lot easier. Thank you, Demetrius. We appreciate you. We appreciate you leading Mississippi. Mm -hmm. We appreciate you being a leader, stepping up, not just sitting on the sidelines. Yeah. Coming in and, and serving, you know, this is a tennis reference. Coming in yeah. and making sure you ace and serve, yeah. you know, a, per, a perfect game and uh, continued success to you. We appreciate you. And thanks so much for being on the podcast. Suzanne, do you have anything before I close this out? I just say thank you again, Demetrius. I'd echo all of that. You're one of my absolute favorite NAFA members. I just, just a joy. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you, Demetrius. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to Advisor Today's podcast, where we uplift and promote the better, the good of all advisors and insurance professionals for the greater good. And thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. And uh, have a great day. See you soon. Thanks for joining us for NAPA's Advisor Today podcast series. Make sure to subscribe to get future episodes. And if you're interested in coming on the show, let us know.